Amen. Thank you, Josh. Man, what a great day this has already been, and it's going to continue to be. <clears throat> We're going to go back to the book of Acts. So um, if you want to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, that would be fine. Um, but I'd also like you to grab, we have stuffed the back of the seats in front of you with all kinds of fun stuff. You ready for this? Um, there might even be a hidden $100 bill in there. No, I'm just joking. But I have thought, if that would get you to actually pull stuff out of there, I might do that. Um, but if, if there, there's notes back there for the message in just a second. And there's also a half sheet that looks something like this. Now, this, this is a list of every single missionary that you support every single month. What does that mean? There's over 80 missionaries listed on it. What does that mean? That means that every month from Pathway, there's anywhere between about $70 to those that are in yellow, those are our strategic missions partners, to $500 every single month through your missions giving that we give, and this helps to keep our missionaries in the field. Oh, there's special projects, and it's cutting in now here. There's, spe <laughs> there's special projects that we might give to for this or that, but your regular missions giving, you know what? That is what keeps the missionaries on the field. And so as you, as you read over this, I, uh, I'm really hearing they're cutting the words out. No, I'll give it just another, I, we'll, we'll just give it one, one more try. But, uh, okay, we're done. I'll take that right there. <laughs> you could have talked, I guess. Yeah, so, so, um, so every one of these missionaries are missionaries that we support, you support. And I encourage you, look it over, pray it over. Maybe there's one or two or three that might pop out at you. And just adopt them. Take them on. And just say, I'm going to pray for that missionary. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to, over the course of the year, I'm going to ask the Lord. Speaking of prayer, though, this Wednesday night, I just, I want to tell you, this is one of the most powerful prayer nights we have. Of course, I say that about every prayer night, but here's the deal. Uh, I really want to encourage you parents, do whatever you can do to get your kids here, not just teenagers, but I'm talking like even your little younger kids. Yeah, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have child care for the, the, like the nursery um, preschool on down type kids. We'll have child care for that. But your other kids, Bring them, because let me tell you, this is the most hands-on prayer experience that we're going to have all year. What we do is we take the chairs, and we push them on the outsides and maybe create some little seating areas here and there. But we fill this sanctuary with maps. And when I say maps, not small maps, you know my love of maps, right? So we're talking big old maps of huge continents and huge continents. We have like seven or eight different maps that we put all over the floor, and we literally lay hands on the nations and we pray for them. And every one of our missionaries that are on here, we've asked them for the top three missions prayer requests. What would their top three requests be? And they've shared those requests with us. And so we'll have a list of all those prayer requests. It is one of the most powerful nights of intercessory prayer that we have. And I need you to be here. We need you to be here. The nations need you to be here because when we pray, God hears. Amen? When we pray, God hears and God moves. And so I want to encourage all of you. We have about 12 missionaries that will actually be with us in person. A, a huge crew from Urban Outreach, one of our uh, strategic missions partners. So Jay Covert's going to be here and some of their other guys from Cleveland and, and uh, from St. Louis, the Bosnian church there. So they're going to be here. We, got, we have some uh, missionaries from Asia. The Beans, who were here last week, they're going to be back with us. And uh, so there's and a bunch of our home missionaries. So there's going to be 12 of them here, so I need at least 12 of you to be sure we outnumber them. No, seriously, though, whatever it takes, you can stay home if you want to, but I'm telling you, you're going to miss out because this is my prayer. This is my prayer, is that even as you bring your children and as they're praying over that five, ten years from now, let me tell you what I, my prayer is, is that one of your kids is going to say something like this. Mom, do you remember that time? when we were in the sanctuary and they had those maps all over the floor and, and they're going to start telling you, I, I, I couldn't, 
I couldn't get past. Every time we went by this country and I started praying over that country, I just felt like God was pulling me there. And now I, I'm like, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And I'm really feeling maybe God's calling me to go there, to do something. Or, or I'm praying that when, when we, we finally got a map of the United States, and for some of you, that's, that's, it's, you don't get it, but for years we've been doing this, and we can't find a big old map of the United States. We got a big old map of the United States, okay? And so we, I, I'm praying that some of your kids, that uh, some of the teenagers in this church, some of the kids who are even younger than that, they're going to come and they're going to be just like, I don't even want to leave the United States. I, I have a heart for all nations, but I want to see my nation change. I feel a call to my nation. I want to see God's kingdom come. I want to see an awakening. And I'm praying that God's going to call pastors and evangelists and apostles and prophets and, and missionaries, all of it, teachers. It's going to happen this Wednesday night. And I want you to give. And all you got to do is show up. That's all you got to do. Just show up. And what if some of us old fogies like me, what if God began to stir your heart for something God is calling you, leading you to? <laughs> I thought I might get a laugh when I said old fogies. Are you guys still with me here? But listen, so, so listen, it's going to be a powerful night of prayer. I've said enough, but I don't know if you can, you can tell. This is, this is a powerful night. We put a lot of time into this. Really want to encourage you to get here, be here. And um, because what God's done in your life is, isn't just about you. It's about us taking what God's done and sharing it. It's about going. After all, Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. This is the Great Commission, right? Look at this on the screen. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is what it says. Therefore, go. It doesn't say stay. It says go. Go and make disciples of your nation. Oh, it says all nations. It says all nations. Listen, believer, listen to me. God's call is for us to take the gospel to all nations, every one of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I love that last part because we can't do this on our own. If he doesn't go with us, we'll fall flat on our face. So glad that God calls us, tells us to go, but he says, I will be with you. And so today, that's, that's every one of these missionaries have answered that call just in the same way that many of us, we, all of us as believers, we've answered the call to follow Christ. Our call is to share right here in our community with well, they're going to other communities and nations around the world. And we want to be a part of that. That's why we're here in the month of February. That's why we talk about evangelism. We talk about going. Every Jesus-centered, spirit-filled church is a missions praying, going, and sending church. There's no such thing as a Jesus-centered, spirit-filled church that's not sending missionaries. And I'm so glad for your heart to do that. Today, just before I, in fact, I just want to warn you, I already started preaching. So you're like, oh, he's already started preaching and now we're going to have a guest. Yeah, just for a couple minutes. I want, I want in just a second, I want Otis Garrison from Mission of Hope. Mission of Hope is one of our strategic missions partners. We've been working really closely with them in Haiti for years. And now because of the unrest and stuff happening in Haiti, you'll hear about that in a second. Um, we're jumping over to the DR and, we, and our team just got back from the DR uh, a week or so ago and they were there and we're there supporting what God's doing there. But I want you to see real quick, quick video and then Otis is going to join me. Here's what's happening through Mission of Hope. Can we watch that? These lands are both hard and beautiful. They are filled with people who know a lot of suffering. In the midst of difficulty, there's opportunity. In the face of pain, we can show love. Mission of Hope started in 1998 in the village of Titan in Haiti, which translates to less than nothing. Since then, we have expanded into the Caribbean, continuing the vision to follow Jesus Christ and bring life transformation to every man, woman, and child. We seek to meet both the physical and the spiritual needs of the people and to empower and equip people to change their countries. 
We begin with education and nutrition. Now, we are educating thousands of students. My vision for the future is to keep studying hard and one day make a difference in this country. I see kids in the street that didn't go to school like I did and I want to help them. We feed over 100,000 kids daily through our nutrition program and Team Hope. To make me feel like a disease and a human being. I want to make a disease and We are empowering people with jobs so they can change their countries. We are treating tens of thousands of medical patients each year. Pastors are being equipped to lead and disciple their communities. We respond to natural disasters and work alongside the church to meet needs. Thousands of North Americans are being mobilized to serve and make a difference. We serve in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and across the Caribbean, working with local churches, partners, and schools. Following Jesus, we will go where he leads. Mission of Hope is all of us, together, committed to life transformation for every man, woman, and child. Mission of Hope. Let's welcome Otis Garrison as he comes. Come on. So Otis, Otis, I'd like to I'd like to think of you as one of the big cheeses as part of um, uh, Mission of Hope. You're vice president of church of church development. All right, all right. So vice president of church development. But Otis has been here the pathway for many times. Um, most of you know we're going to be packing food as soon as the service is over. Can I just say something before I forget? If you didn't sign up to help us pack food, there's still room for you if you'd like to hang around. Um, all, all, all we need is just to be like fifth grade and up. So if you, if you reach that point, then we're good. <laughs> it's not because we're afraid about your education. It's just um, anyhow. Um, <clears throat> but but here's, here's the deal. We'd love to have you stick around. But oh, a mission of hope is bigger than just food. So let, let, let's, let's back up just a second because we've been praying. In fact, several months ago when, when stuff really got got heated in Haiti, I, and, and it continues to get heated, but when specifically in Titayan and Susmatla, um, those areas, we prayed really, really hard for those people and the people that we love that are in those areas. So how is Mission of Hope doing? Talk to us a little bit about the campus, because there was even one time where we were afraid from what we were hearing was that maybe the campus of Mission of Hope was even going to be taken over by the gangs and those type of things. So talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it has definitely been a difficult time uh, in the country of Haiti with Mission of Hope and, and a lot of ministries. And as gangs were moving across the country, uh, they were entering different organizations and actually stealing food, etc. cetera. And uh, the local gang of Titayan, who we have ministered to in some way over the years, they, uh, they actually have chosen to protect Mission of Hope. Isn't that just like uh, I, I can't say that without feeling um, a lot of emotion because those are people that we know. Uh, some of them don't serve Jesus at all, but uh, this, is a, this is a pathway. Well, that's a good name. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. This yeah. is a pathway for, a good name for them a to come to Christ. And a lot of it was just because we helped them with nutrition at some point in their life. So Yeah. So, so I just want to make sure that's clear. So the gangs that are going and destroying other areas, God, God has given Mission of Hope, in a sense, favor with these gangs. They're protecting, saying, hey, hands off a of Mission of Hope. Why? Because of what God is already doing through their ministry and has been doing since 1998. Is that right? Yeah. 1998, when Mission of Hope first got started there in Titayan. It'd be kind of like the Philistines tr protecting Jerusalem, right? Or yeah, yeah, exactly. It's crazy. But God is using it. And so um, just one, one other thing real quick, just about Haiti, because I know many of you have been there along with, with me. We've been there. We've done that. Is the ministry still happening there? Because there are no American staff in, in Haiti right now. Is that right? Right. 
Um, there's no, because of the safety, you, if you've been there, it, it's really difficult and not safe to get from the airport to Titian, where Mission of Hope is. You, you just, you got to get an armored car the whole bit. So there's no American staff there. So what's going on? Is ministry yeah. still happening? Wow, yeah, in fact, that's, that was the dream of Brad and Vanessa when uh, Mission of Hope was first founded. I, I connected in 1999, I heard Brad say that. He eventually wants all of us to work our way out of a job and through exactly. all the difficulties. Now we have 430 some employees, Haitian employees at the mission. Yeah, so it's still going. <laughs> yeah, and our staff on the ground, they've been incredible amazing at what they've done. People are still coming to Christ. School is back in session. The clinic is open. Food's being moved across the country, at least at those day, on those days that we can. Yeah. And so literally still feeding thousands and thousands of people in, in many areas. Some of the, the places we were taking food, school wasn't in session, were actually had turned into refuge camps yeah. from people that were fleeing villages because of the gangs. And we were able some way to get food over to those camps so that the people could continue to eat. And so, yeah, our, our staff, our leadership team is amazing in Haiti. So, yeah. And it's Haitian-led. At this point, and this is something that's different. For those of you who have been there, this is something different. It's just completely Haitian-led, which is the prayer. And because of COVID and because of the unrest, it pretty much... Force that to happen right here, right now. So it's awesome to see what God's still doing there. And, and, and now jumping over to the Dominican Republic, starting to set up um, uh, teams there to do ministry there in much the way that we did in Haiti. Um, but anyhow, be, w without getting too much into that, let's just talk just real quick, because we're about ready to do 40,000 meals this afternoon. Well, once church is over, we're going to pack 40,000 meals. And, and, but let me, just, let me just go back to this. You Right now, Mission of Hope is feeding over, uh, they're sending out over 100,000 meals. 125,000 meals a day. A day. Okay. okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa. Yeah, 125,000 meals a day. All right. Uh, every <laughs> single day. Yeah, yeah. And, and so um, imagine that, that the only, for, for, there's some people, some kids, the only meal they get is at school. And th these are Christian schools. These are schools that are sharing the gospel. And, and most of them have a church within them. So it's just, it's a huge win. So anyhow, presenting the gospel, bringing the food, all that kind of stuff. Talk a little bit about the food, the food thing just for a second. Tell us what, what we need to know about. Just Yeah, just real, real quick. I don't, I don't know how many minutes I have, probably 30 seconds. But oh, yeah, five. The whole new, <clears throat> five seconds. Okay, I'm done. See you. <laughs> but the nutrition program was started with a peanut grinder. Yeah. And they took that mush and they spread it on bread. That was back in 1998. I actually got to see that work in 1999. It was, it was nailed to a tree. Now moving forward in 2009, we connected with Convoy of Hope. They started being a, a shipping partner for us. And through all of that, moving into today is how we're moving 125,000 mills a day across Haiti. Now, it sounds like a big number, and then you think you're only doing 40,000 mills in, in this event today. Yeah. Guess what? 40,000 mills will feed 200 children for the next year. So, yeah. yes, yeah. you are impacting the lives, not only nutritionally, but spiritually. And so thank you. Thank you. One of the, one of the things I love about this, too, is, is not just feeding and taking care of people physically, but the spiritual impact we're making. Mission of Hope. Their, their goal is to work through the local church. They, they champion the local church. Even as our team was there uh, uh, two weeks ago, it wasn't, they weren't, weren't just going willy-nilly wherever they wanted to go. No, it's like, where, where's their local church, and how can we team up with that local church? Because when we're long gone, that local church is still there. Mission of Hope is still there, but they're connecting in with the local church, and I love it. Mission of Hope is one of our strategic missions partners. Um, they've been one of our partners for uh, at least 10 years now, but I'm so glad that we can be a part of what God's doing um, now, even beyond Haiti and looking at other Caribbean uh, islands and other areas where they can do ministry. Is there anything else you want to say I, before I, do. I, I start preaching? My wife is here. Oh, that's right. She is not a myth. She actually <laughs> exists. For you that have known me for a long time, so this is her back here at the door. She will be at a merch table and we have some other things on the table. You can buy T-shirts or whatever. Yeah. We have caps. I tried to give your pastor a cap. He said he's not into hats. It messes up his hair. So <laughs> anyway, we, 
we'll give uh, somebody else. Anybody want this cap? Oh, look at that. I mean, oh, you want to give it to somebody? Wait, you didn't want I, it. I saw it back, back there, I back row, right there. It, it is. Come on up here. Wanted... Come on up here, Mas. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There it is. Can, Can I throw you... it? No. <laughs> she said no. <laughs> it's only half price now, so that was all okay. right. Thanks, Char. This is my wife right here. Hey, so. welcome, Char. <clears throat> She's. Been married to me for 44 years. Can you believe that? 44 wow. years. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. God's grace. All right. Thank Thanks. you, Otis. Thank you, Mission of Hope. Well, you know, um, they, I, it, it was just by chance. I saw a, a pastor friend of mine in 2010, 2009. They were going down to Haiti. I was like, where are you going in Haiti? And uh, that led to us taking a trip in 2011 and connecting, and God connected our hearts. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Otis, and, and glad you're here. And uh, once again, if you want to be a part of feeding 200 people for the next year, stick around after service. Jason Brooks is in charge. He's not in here right now. Um, but uh, anyhow, um, see Jason Brooks, and we'll get you at a table, and it'll be good stuff. Are you to the book of Acts yet? Are you there yet? <laughs> Acts chapter 18, somewhere in that area. Let me, just, let me just tell you, just remind you, this is what we've been talking about. We've been talking about um, uh, not just missions and evangelism, but specifically in the book of Acts, we've been talking about um, uh, uh, Paul's missionary journey. Paul's missionary journeys. Paul, the Apostle Paul took several missionary journeys. Today I want to talk to you about the third one, and then we want to talk about what, what's so important about the third one. What can we learn from this third one? But I, 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 I put it in the context of this month, and what God's doing in our church right now, let me just tell you, a, a God-fearing, a, 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 a church that has God's heartbeat is a church that's a missions church. A church that's focus isn't just on themselves, though we need that. We need fellowship. We need to be together and ministering to one another, but we also need to be going and sending and praying. And so that's, that's why we're talking about the third missionary journey. So let's just, I know you've been waiting for it. Here it is, the third Paul's missionary journey, the third, the map. Here it is. Let's take a look on the map and follow along with me. This is a little different than my other ones, trying to get a little more upscale. I did not, I did not draw this. I don't know who did, but thank you if you happen to see that we're using it. Um, someone on, on, on the Internet did. This is the account of Paul's, notice over here in Antioch. So that's where Paul started. That's where it, it, Syrian Antioch was, was kind of the, the home church. And um, so they were traveling. He, he said, come on, let's go. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. They, on, on the way out, they, they went through Tarsus Derby, Iconium, Lystra, and kind of third journey, just hitting churches that they had already started, they had already visited. Paul arrived at, at Ephesus, and he spent three months teaching in the synagogues there, Scripture says, reasoning with the Jews. Do you see where Ephesus is right there, the big one in the middle? And um, some people became a little abusive, as seemed to be the pattern. <laughs> when the Apostle Paul comes to your city, he preaches the gospel, and you get mad at him. Some people turn their lives over to Christ. Others get upset. And so they moved out of the synagogue. And uh, for two, it looks like for two years, in fact, according to Scripture, for two years he stayed and he taught there uh, at this guy named Tyran Tyrannus's place there. So despite the opposition in Ephesus, the Holy Spirit worked mighty miracles. There was supernatural display happening. And after his stay in Ephesus, Paul realized the Holy Spirit was telling them, travel on, my brother. So he continued on in this journey. He sent Timothy and Erastus ahead of him to Macedonia. Macedonia is that area where uh, Thessalonica is in, in that area right there. So he sent them on ahead. And after a hubbub over a silversmith's loss of income, Paul left town quietly, went across the Aegean Sea to Macedonia where he traveled to Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. You see where that's at there? And uh, after that, uh, he planned to board a ship in Corinth, down here at the bottom, he planned to jump on a ship and just go all the way back here to Jerusalem. But he caught, he caught wind that there was some people that were looking to do some bad stuff to him on that. And so he decided, instead, I'm going to go back on land. So he starts making his way back. Um, he discovers some Jews were plotting against him. So he retraced his steps from Corinth 
back up to Berea and around Thessalonica and Philippi. From Philippi, Paul and Luke set sail for Troas. After arriving there five days and meeting Paul's traveling companions who had gone ahead of them, they all stayed in Troas for a week. Um, interesting piece about Troas. I know you all want to know. Um, I've caught many of you falling asleep in the midst of a message. It just happens. I know. As I'm preaching, sometimes I see those eyelids start to close. I've yet to see any of you fall out of your chair, let alone fall out of a window. But if you read it, when he was in Troas, there's this dude named Eutychus. It was late at night. Paul is preaching, and he keeps preaching. And preaching. Eutychus is in the second story window. <laughs> Splat. Um, uh, maybe splats too much, but he died. But Paul, under the, with the power of the Holy Spirit, went and brought him back to life. That's where that happened, right there in Troas. So instead of traveling inland, Paul, um, Paul stayed on the, on the coast. He didn't go back over here on his way back. You can see where in, they ended up in Miletus. Paul said, I didn't want to go to Ephesus because I knew there'd be a lot of people who want to see me and talk to me. And, I, and so he went to Miletus and he called for the Ephesian elders. And this is a really, if you read the passage, it's a really emotional time because the, the, the people in Ephesus knew this would be the last time that they would see Paul. They knew that Paul's life was coming to an end, that his ministry was coming. Their, their hearts just were, were, were torn, and you, you, can, you can see that in the text as you read it. And um, so from Miletus, so Paul and his entourage sailed to Patera, and then they made their way all over Tyre and Caesarea and eventually into Jerusalem. And um, while, while uh, he was in Jerusalem, it looks like there's a guy with a funny name, and, and I even heard someone pronounce it Manason, but I think it's just Nason. Nason stayed at Nason's house, and they hosted him and the companies by the time he got to Jerusalem. And thus, Paul's third missionary journey came to an end somewhere around 59 A.D. And uh, we, we have pretty good knowledge that the Apostle Paul died uh, four or five years later. Um, history records that it was beheading. So um, he did take one more fourth journey, but it was more, uh, it was kind of a different thing. We're not necessarily going to get into that. Um, but this, this is what I just want you to see. As, as we just conclude even the three missionary, main three missionary journeys, each one of these journeys, there was a reason he went. Um, the, the church, the church was the sending agency. The local churches sent them out. The local churches supported them, and oftentimes as he was out there visiting even Ephesus and other churches, he would even take up offerings and stuff from those local churches and, and sometimes even take them back to Jerusalem or the Jerusalem poor. For some reason, it seemed like the believers in Jerusalem had a really hard time right now, in, in, in especially maybe in, in some of the earlier ones, uh, journeys. So anyhow, I, I just... I, I know for some of you, like, why do you keep showing us these maps? What's the big deal? Well, I want you to see this is, this is, this is real. This is what the ch church does. I mean, for 2,000 years, the church has been called to send missionaries, to send people to go here in our own nation and to the nations around the world. That's why we do this as a church. That's why this is so important. So here's the thing. Okay, land the airplane, Scott. What can we learn? What are, what, what, what are a couple things we can pull out? There are so many things I could pull out from this third missionary journey. Let me just hit a couple. Grab the notes and follow along, and let me just say it. First off, we must be courageous and pers uh, we must be a courageous and persistent church. A courageous and persistent church. There was a silversmith that caused some issues because he's making all these idols, right? And the Apostle Paul is what? Preaching against the idols. And that's kind of the quick version of, of Acts chapter 19, verse 23 to about 27. If we could jump to verse 28. Can you jump me to verse 28? If you look on the screen or look in your Bibles at verse 28 of Acts chapter 19, it says, when they heard this, so who's they? The, the other people who are um, selling and making these, these idols, and they're like, we're, we're going to lose money because this revival's happening here, and, and, and they don't want to worship other gods and other things. So when they heard this, they were furious, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus. Who are they? Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia and rushed as one man into the theater. This is what I want you to see. How did Paul respond? Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. 
But the disciples would not let him. And not only the disciples, but even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him, don't go into that theater. There are thousands of people now. This whole town is just, <clears throat> it's going to be bad news if you go in there. But what did Paul want to do? He was strong. He was courageous. He said, are you kidding me? I'll confront these turkeys. He said, I, these are my friends. These were his traveling companions, Gaius and Aristarchus. They had grabbed these. You know what? I'm going to go stand up for those guys. And while I'm at it, I'm going to preach the gospel. Paul was not backing down. He was, but they're holding him back. <clears throat> I, I, I just, I, I need you to see if there's ever a time for our church and for the churches to be bold and courageous and persistent and not shrink back, but boldly move forward. Now is that time at the end of the third missionary journey um, in Acts chapter 21, verse four, finding the disciples there in Tyre, we stayed with them seven days through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. All the disciples, oh, excuse me, all, yeah, all the disciples, excuse me, through the Spirit, not, but when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children come out of the city, and there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and they returned home. Paul's about to go to Jerusalem. And it says, through the Spirit. Does that seem kind of interesting? Have you ever read that? Maybe this is the first time you've read it. You're like, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. There's, there's godly people, godly leaders through the Spirit, capital S. That's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit had some kind of prophetic word, something, and said, don't go. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But then Paul went ahead and went. So who's right? <laughs> Was it these people or was it Paul? Does that cause any confusion? Let me, just, let me just clarify something here. After studying this, I think this makes a whole lot more sense when you look at in the context of this whole passage. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Was Paul disobeying the Holy Spirit by continuing his journey to Jerusalem? I would say it's very doubtful. And let me just share from the Life Application Bible Commentary, one of the commentaries I look to all the time. Here it is. More likely, the Holy Spirit warned these believers about the suffering that Paul would face in Jerusalem. So more likely, it was like the Holy Spirit showed them, you go to Jerusalem, it's going to end badly. This isn't going to go good. The Holy Spirit somehow gave them a word of this. And so they were saying, don't go, don't go. As we, as we think, think through this even further, they drew the conclusion that he should not go there because of that danger. And this is supported, if we could jump over to, to Acts 21, verse 12 through 14. So Acts 21, verse 12, when he heard this, we and, the, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to tie in Jerusalem to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus when he would be dissuaded. He, when he would not be dissuaded, he, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So as you look at this as a whole, I don't think the Holy Spirit was contradicting the Holy Spirit. I think the people were saying there's danger coming up. And Paul, he was courageous. He was persistent. And like someone who we studied back in Luke chapter 9, he set his eyes on Jerusalem just like his Savior, just like Jesus. When Jesus set his heart, set his eyes on Jerusalem to go give his life for, for many, the Apostle Paul knew this was the time that I need to go to Jerusalem myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, as, as we keep, keep looking, the phrase through the Holy Spirit simply means that the Spirit had revealed Paul's suffering in Jerusalem and beyond. It was going to happen. There's going to be suffering. But Paul... Followed the will of God. In, earlier on in Acts chapter 21, verse 10, can you jump back to there? It says, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. What that means is we'll hand, you're going to be bound up in Jerusalem, and you're going to be handed over to the Romans. And the Romans are going to take you, and you're going to go to Rome really in chains. And what was Paul's response again? Paul's response was, listen, I feel your heart. Thank you. 
but I got to do what God's called me to do. Oh, that, that this church, that the church of, true church of America, but that this church would be a courageous church, a bold church. God, give us this courage. Give our families this courage to be strong and courageous and make the right call, do the right thing, be persistent to let the Lord's will be done, even in the face of adversity that may come from people that we've loved, we've been friends with for years, but all of a sudden they're, they're preaching and teaching and believing a different gospel. We've got to be careful. It's time for a courageous church. It's time for a persistent church. Let's go to the second thing. <clears throat> we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit's power. Josh, uh, our executive pastor, writes the discussion questions, and I'm going to steal a thought that he shared in one of the questions. Stating the obvious, this discussion is about a need, not a want. Look in Acts chapter 19, will you? In Acts chapter 19, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul comes upon these Ephesian disciples. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this... They got saved. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were all about 12 men in all. This is what I want you to get. In Acts chapter 2 was the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit came on people. Let me just clarify something. Every person, the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, the moment you give your, you repent of your sins and you invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit comes in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. You're, you're, you're made alive spiritually. You're regenerated. It's awesome. You're justified. You're sanctified. The Holy Spirit's in you. And those people that had had that experience, Jesus tells those disciples in Acts chapter 2, wait here, because I'm going to pour out my Spirit on you and the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. And that's exactly what we see in the book of Acts. We see it in Acts chapter 2. We see it again in Acts chapter 8. This isn't on the screen, but when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they were born again. They sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. They had been born again. They had been saved. But there was a second work of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, while Peter was in the midst of preaching, um, this is what it says in verse 44. The Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. This is, this is what I, chapter 19, that's where we're at. Okay, so Acts chapter 19, what happened here? On hearing this, they were baptized in the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, when he placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. I know for some of you, I'm, I'm just waiting for you to get it. I'm just waiting for you to get it. Because some of you are so content with just that the Holy Spirit's come in you, you're saved, you're born again. But I want to tell you there's more. The person of the Holy Spirit, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? Have you received the power of the Holy Spirit in this way? Has, have you asked, and are we walking in this daily? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to, have you asked Jesus even to baptize you in his Holy Spirit, to fill you up? Are we walking in that fullness? Some of you have yet to get that revelation, but I just want to encourage you every single day, pray, Lord, fill me today. Lord, baptize me today. Why? Because I want your power. I want you to move through me. I want you to minister through me. What do I need power for? Well, what do they have power for in Scripture? In fact, let me share this with you. It's in your notes or it's on the screen. This is from, of all people, Chuck Swindoll. Um, I say that only because, well, let's keep going. <laughs> the Greek term for power, look at this. Dunamis refers to one's ability or capacity. It suggests being able or being capable of something. The specific ability or capability in question depends upon the context. The Lord's promise leaves the dunamis indefinite. In other words, whatever is required will receive the power to do what God asks. If the task is to lift a great weight, the ability is physical strength. If the task is to defeat an army, the capacity is that of a seasoned general. Why is this important? It's because God wants to give you power for whatever, you, whatever it is you need. 
He wants to empower you to go win people to Jesus. He wants to empower you to share the gospel. He wants to empower you to be the husband you need to be. He wants to empower you to be the mother that he needs you to be. He wants to empower you to be the grandparents. He, he wants to empower you to be the son, the daughter. He wants to empower you at work. He wants to empower you at play. He wants to empower you in the marketplace and in church. He wants to empower you. He wants to give you power. Power for what? Well, power for the miraculous. In, in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, it says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even the handkerchiefs and the aprons had touched him, were taken and sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Now, I know some churches that even do this. It's not a bad idea. I don't know if this was meant to be prescriptive, that now we need to start a handkerchief ministry. I don't know. I, 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 but but if, if someone did that, I'd be all right with it. We see it in the Bible, but here's the deal. The big thing is this. It was the power of God miraculously moving. We need this. We need this power. You, you see it even later on in, in chapter 20, verse 10. Look at this. This is where good old uh, Eutychus, um, verse 10, Paul went down, threw himself on Eutychus, the dude who fell out the second story window, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Tis only a flesh wound. He's alive. And God, God brought him back to life. I know sometimes we read stuff like this, and it's like, is God really, does he still do this kind of thing? That, that's, that's what I talked about last fall. Do you remember John Wimber? This dude is, uh, was used mightily um, back in the late 70s and 80s and even in the 90s um, uh, in, in the Vineyard Church. But long story short, John Wimber got radically saved, and he's going to a church that keeps going up to his pastor. Uh, pastor, when do we get to do the stuff? When do we get to do the stuff? And finally, his pastor got annoyed enough and said, what are you talking about? Why are you reading the Gospels? And I read the book of Acts, and they're doing the stuff. They're, they're praying for people, and they're being healed. There's, there's miraculous things happening. When do we get to do that? And his pastor was like, uh, we don't believe that's for today. Let me just tell you, we're not one of those churches. <laughs> We believe absolutely it's for today. That's why the Holy Spirit's here, to empower us. Listen, God wants to heal people through you. It starts with repentance for you, getting your life right with God, and get it full of the Spirit of God. Ask God to baptize you with the Spirit so we can do that, so we can do the stuff. And not only for miracles, but also for guidance. I mean, you, you see all throughout these chapters that we're studying in this third missionary journey, how many times the Holy Spirit guided them, the Holy Spirit guided them, the Holy Spirit guided them. We've talked a lot about that. Um, but it's, it's really, the Holy Spirit wants to empower you for ministry, but let me say something else, because we're going to talk about this through the whole month of March. He wants to empower you for maturity. Several months ago, the Lord laid that on my heart because I'm just telling you, when I read the book of Acts, the main thing I see is miracle, 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 miracle. I see ministry miracles. I, I, that's all I see. And as I was praying and just thinking about where we're going with our messages, I just felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but it's not just all the miraculous that I do. The Holy Spirit helps you to be mature in him and to have things like the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Oh, come on. Let's talk more about the miracles. Let's see sick people. Let's see Eutychus come back to life. Come on. I love that. I love that too. But what good is it if we have a church full of miracles, but we can't pay our bills? If we're not faithful, if we're not kind, that's going to be the whole month of March. I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, I'm telling you, I believe God's going to speak to us because just as important the power of the Holy Spirit is there just as important for our ministry to minister to others. It's also there for our maturity. So we're going to talk about that. But let's go to the third thing. Let's finish this up. And this is really a preaching to myself. You ready for this? Fill this in. We need strong, God-fearing leadership. Doesn't that sound like it just would fit in a southern Pentecostal church? We need some strong, God-fearing leadership. We need a southern draw when you say that one. We need some strong, God-fearing leadership. I couldn't come up with a better way of saying it than that. We need pastors who lead by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and they aren't looking to take little pieces of Scripture and say, ah, it's not for today, or you know what, God didn't mean that. No, we need pastors who are going to be God-fearing to know that one day we're going to stand before God, and I'm going to answer how did I present the full gospel? How did I present the Word of God? Can I just ask you today, would you pray for me? 
Would you pray for us, all the pastoral staff? Would you pray for the eldership? Would you pray for us regularly and say, oh God, please help them because they need it. Just ask their wives and their spouses. And in, in, um, um, in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, it says this. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Even go back to, uh, to chapter, uh, verse 20. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. We need pastors, and we need, we even need godly parents. We need fathers, leaders of the home. We need, we need moms as well. We need all of us, parents working together to lead their homes and, 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 and say, you know, I'm going to teach you the whole of Scripture. Well, I don't like that part. I don't care if you don't like it. We're going to feed it to you anyhow. The Apostle Paul was like, I didn't hold anything back. I let you have it because I'm going, to be, I'm going to be judged someday for how I led the local church. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. I've been spying on a church. I'm not going to tell you what church it is, but it's a big name church that's here in the United States. And if I said it, you probably don't. This isn't the same one I mentioned about two weeks ago. So this is a different church. I'm really, I'm not on a heresy hunt. I'm just telling you, I'm not on a heresy hunt. But I've been listening for several weeks to this church um, on Saturday evenings, and I have yet to hear them say the word sin. I've heard them say every other word. Is that a big deal? I don't know. It just kind of bothers me. Because we, don't, we haven't just done bad things and we need to get right with God. We have sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we need to repent of these sins. We need to come clean. What does that mean? It's like, God, not only am I sorry I did it, but I'm turning my back on it and I'm asking you for power to walk away from it. I don't, I don't want to be a part of it anymore. I, I'm repenting of that sin. And that was his message. Turn to God in repentance and then put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will never be good enough. I will never be good enough to deserve the salvation through Jesus Christ. But yet he freely gives it and we put our faith in him to teach without hesitation. And, and even as we get to verse 28, look at that of, of chapter 20. It says, um, well, even verse 27, for I have not hesitated to proclaim you the whole will of God. Verse 28, keep watch over yourselves and this was our staff meeting Tuesday morning. Let me just tell you. This was our staff meeting Tuesday morning. Our staff met in here, and we prayed, Oh, God, help us. Help, help us. Keep yourselves. Keep yourselves. Watch. Keep a watch over yourselves. And all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Listen to me. If there's ever any question to you whether Jesus, was, he, was Jesus Christ just a good man? Was he just a good teacher, maybe a prophet? I don't know, but he was a good dude. Or was he God? Right there it is. Right there it is. Be shepherds of the church of who? God, which he bought with his own blood. Jesus Christ was fully God, yet fully man. You walk away from that. You walk away from Christian orthodoxy. You walk away from Christianity. You walk away from the power of God, and you walk away from truth. But you, we accept the fact that Jesus is fully God, yet fully man. And, and uh, the bigger picture there, though, is this. Keep watch. We, we as leaders of the church and you as leaders of your home, Keep watch because the devil, the enemy, is going to come to try to steal, kill, and destroy and take you out. We cannot think that the devil's just going to sit back and say, oh, Pathway Church is growing. Oh, they're reaching more people. Oh, there's more people being saved and discipled there. It's not like the devil's going to say, oh, I'm not too worried about him. Just walk away. No, he's going to fight tooth and nail. Oh, Pathway's thinking of adding on a sanctuary and figuring out a way to create more space for people to worship together. You think the devil's just going to sit around and let it happen? No. He's going to cause you to get irritated at something I said or somebody else in the church and cause division and cause all kinds of stuff. He's going to do all kinds of stuff like that to try to destroy you and your family. He's going to cause husbands and wives to get mad at each other. Anytime God is trying to do something powerful and significant, the enemy comes against. But here's the good news. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, right? The, here's, here's the good news. If we submit to God, his will, his way, and we resist the devil, James, the book of James says, he must flee, right? There's the good news right there. So, all that to say, 
what can you get out of the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul? Well, there's just a couple things. I've got a few more, but we'll stop there. Um, but I, I want to I end and, and finish. And could I just have Tate? Could you just come to the keys? Just Tate's fine. Um, I, I want you to look at verse 28 one more time. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Which he bought with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. Or maybe even better put, the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. If you're new to church, if you're new to Christianity, and you're still trying to figure it all out, let me just tell you, this, this is where it's all at right here. It's in the cross. When, when we celebrated Easter, what Jesus did when he died on the cross, it's because every one of us are sinful, and we, we need to do something about our sin. And Jesus said, here I am. Jesus came from heaven. He's always been, but he came down, and he gave his life willingly on the cross for our sin. He died for our sin. which he bought with his own blood. I deserved the penalty of death. I deserve to pay for my sin. But Jesus stepped in and said, I'll take that upon me and I'll give my life. And there's only one person that could have done that. That was no man. That was God himself. Because he was a spotless lamb. He was spotless. He was sinless, the Bible says. And that's what he bought your, your life with his precious blood. And let me just ask you, have you given your life to Christ? Have you repented of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you haven't, let me just encourage you, today's your day. Now's the time. Now's the time. Right now. Because as long as you go in your life, there's going to be an empty hole in your heart. There's going to be an emptiness in your life. I'm just telling you, you might already feel it. You can try to fill it with all kinds of other stuff. You can fill it with good works and feel really good about yourself. But there's, there's going to be a hole in your, in, your, in your life, an emptiness, until you surrender your life to Christ because you were created to serve God. You're created to follow Christ. And He bought your sin. He paid the price for your sinfulness through his precious blood. Will you receive what he did for you on the cross today? Would you just close your eyes with me right now?